I was asked, uh, and I'm very grateful for the invitation to come here. I've been aware of the Mises Institute kind of at the periphery of my uh, consciousness. Uh, never imagined that I would be asked to interact with you folks or have the privilege uh, of being here, uh, for which I'm grateful. In, in trying to, and, and I, I travel all the time, I talk all the time, most of those talks are easy to give, uh, but this was different. This is uh, talking to an audience, a younger audience, that's becoming expert in a domain that I am absolutely a neophyte in. I'm just starting to learn about the underpinnings of the logic of Rothbard, Mises, and economics in general. I never took an economics course during my undergraduate or graduate training. Uh, I was too busy in the world of molecular this and that. Uh, and now I find that in my journey to try to comprehend what transpired during the COVID crisis, that economics is the center of it all. Now I find that economics is what's driving politics. Now I find that it's the markets, it's Mr. Market, that is defining the new world order. It's defining what political reality is. It's defining what is acceptable, the acceptable range of politics. Essentially, the Overton window, if you're familiar with that, of uh, politics is being defined economically. Uh, and clearly, I need to come up to speak. So this lecture gave me an opportunity to try to start to think through the uh, kind of simplistic understanding that I had about libertarianism coming from my experience when I was about your age, uh, burning through all the Ayn Rand books, uh, and by the way, hence the origin of the name of our substack, who is Robert Malone, is a nod to uh, who's John Galt, in case you didn't figure that out. Um, so as I started to try to process what we discuss in the book uh, and the experiences and journey that uh, Dr. Joel Glasspool Malone and myself have had in, through the COVID crisis and all of my colleagues, so many people that have contributed to uh, the, we could call it the resistance, it seems a little grandiose, uh, um, this kind of burgeoning movement of uh, advocates for uh, personal rights, medical freedom, and freedom in general. Uh, I, I tried to think hard about um, libertarianism, uh, Rothbard's wisdom, and uh, what I'm observing in the real world uh, marketplace that I live in one that is very much influenced by psychological warfare. Uh, and I'm deeply troubled by what I'm encountering, uh, and, and I hope to learn and explore, and maybe we'll get a chance to talk about that a little bit uh, before the hour is out, uh, the kind of the limits of a pure libertarian thought as they interface with this new world of fifth generation warfare and psychological warfare. Um, I, I find that domain extremely troubling because the underpinning logic in, uh, in Rothbard's analysis, in libertarian and libertarian Terrianism in general, has to do with the free will, sovereignty, and autonomy of the individual. And with this technology, those concepts become obsolete to a significant extent. Now, I, I'm a little fearful because I've been living in this world for four years now, and you haven't. Uh, and so uh, maybe you have, but maybe not obsessing about it the way that I have. And so I don't want to leave you behind. So when I say things, if they don't make sense, please ask. 
okay? It's okay, I love questions. It's okay to interrupt me. Robert, I don't understand that. Can you elaborate? Can you clarify? Define that term. It doesn't make sense to me. I used to be an academic. I can handle it. Okay? So when I say things, and perhaps I might be assuming that I'm being clear to you, and you're not following it, I want to know that. I want that feedback because it's super important to me that I communicate effectively with you. That's the whole reason why I'm here. Now, I'm going to start with a quote from George Bernard Shaw, famous playwright. All censorships exist to prevent anyone from challenging current conceptions and existing institutions. All progress is initiated by challenging current conceptions and executed by supplanting existing institutions. Consequently, the first condition of progress is the removal of censorship. Simple stuff. I could imagine Rothbard writing that. The title of the book, the title of the topic, Psy War, Enforcing the New World Order, involves the interface between this modern technology of advanced psychological manipulation technology test capabilities, um, science, and this push towards globalism, or I like to point out, it's functionally globalized corporatism. And I repeatedly make the point that Benito Mussolini defined fascism as corporatism. Okay? We, the term fascism has been twisted and bastardized by modern media to mean something which is different from its original intent. For me, I believe that with all of these political terms and sociologic terms, we have to go back to ground and make sure we have common language and communication. And as far as I'm concerned, fascism and corporatism are one and the same, and we now are moving into a space in which globalized corporatism is becoming the norm. It is the accepted vision for a large fraction of global leadership, including the United Nations, World Economic Forum, World Health Organization, etc., for the new model for the world order. So when I say Psy War enforcing the new world order, what I'm talking about is the interface between this technology of psychological manipulation of populations at mass scale and the politics and economics of this globalist push that we're in the middle of right now, that Klaus Schwab refers to as the Great Reset. It was actually first referred to as the Great Reset by the current King of England. Okay? This, is, this is a trend which, as I look out on this sea of young faces, I'm sorry to say it's going to dominate a lot of your reality as you get to be an old fart like me. Um, my expertise in this topic derives from four years of exposure to the technology and daily efforts over that period to try to understand what I was experiencing and frame those experiences within a broader context. I'm a physician and a scientist. I was trained as a scientist. I was trained to think as a scientist along the lines of methods of multiple working hypotheses. I don't have a hypothesis. I try to generate a swarm of explanations and then discern which of those are true. That's how I approach the world, and I brought those skills and experience and training into this domain of trying to comprehend what was deployed against me. Deployed against me by media, I could cite multiple examples, they're in the book, by the government, by a variety of different forces. It's not personal, it's not that I'm so important, it just happened that the collusion of experience, time, my background, etc., put me in the crosshairs of this juggernaut technology that's now being deployed globally against many, many people, not just myself. In terms of the broad outline of this discussion, I want to start by exploring the use of psychological warfare and fifth generation warfare technologies during the COVID crisis. So I'm talking about the last four years. We could say since the fall of 2019. 
Then I'll proceed to psychological bioterrorism, emphasizing the COVID-19 crisis and avian influenza. We are currently living in yet another round of psychological bioterrorism that's being deployed on us, in case you didn't figure that out. Then I'll discuss this term that really troubles me, surveillance capitalism. It's surveillance capitalism, the interface of surveillance capitalism and the theories that underpin the Mises-Rothbard logic that is really troubling me. And conclude with some personal comments regarding globalism and my opinion about globalism that I hope might help you. Let's start with first principles. In the anatomy of the state, Rothbard argues there are two means for producing wealth. You guys all know this. You've been taking this course. Economic means refers to producing and exchanging goods and services through voluntary human effort, creativity, and entrepreneurship. Economic means are additive, generating wealth for all parties involved. It is a voluntary transaction that Rothbart builds his you know, step-by-step, brick-by-brick logic that underpins everything that we're talking about here, the whole frame of reference for the world. It's what I love about Rothbard. He goes back to ground zero and builds the house you know, from the foundation up. But it all presumes free will. It presumes a system in which both parties engaging in an economic transaction are doing so through exercise of their own free will. Political means, the other means of acquiring wealth, um, and I, I really appreciated this little bumper sticker. Inflation is theft, right? Um, political means refers to using force or coercion to seize wealth from others. Political means are reductive, distorting incentives and undermining long-term prosperity. For example, taxation is a form of theft in which political means are used to seize wealth from others. I assert that surveillance capitalism meets the criteria of a political means of theft in which accumulated personal wealth in the form of fundamental, personal, and proprietary aspects of your soul are forcefully extracted without your permission and commodified without your permission. Surveillance capitalism is the business model that drives revenue for Amazon, Google, and Facebook, and so many other of the new tech industry, okay? And it's based on extraction of value without your permission from you. You follow what I'm saying? This is also pursued, this business model which I don't think Rothbart has, could, it's not covered. Um, I hope that some of you someday might illuminate this space and give us the intellectual underpinnings to understand and bring the logic, to the extent it exists, of surveillance capitalism into the frame of reference of libertarianism. Right now it doesn't exist. Um, this is also the business model pursued by the entire mercenary censorship industrial complex, the fact checker industry, and a wide range of non-governmental cutout organizations which act on behalf of a variety of governmental NGO and corporate organizations. Okay? These all function. They generate profit by extracting value without your permission from the very essence of who you are, what you say, what you think, what you feel, that is what's extracted from you, reformulated, packaged as a product, and then re typically repeatedly sold as basically futures, a commodified future based on essential characteristics of who you are and what you think and believe and feel what your motivations are, okay? That's, that is the essence of the modern uh, 
social media internet industry. In a sense, corporate media also pr practice a form of surveillance capitalism in which they engage in slander and defamation to advance political objectives and perspectives by intentionally and maliciously damaging reputations. Think about it, okay? Corporate media generates profit by basically taking from you, if you become their target, and it, you can watch it playing out right now in real time in the presidential election. Look at the, the, what's being deployed against the new vice president candidate, okay? Um, what was uh, deployed against Nicole Shanahan when it was announced that she was going to run as Bobby Kennedy's VP, okay? They, they extract aspects of your soul, reformulate them, and weaponize them as slander and defamation and generate profit in doing so. It is their core business model, okay? They, they train journalists, modern, they call it advocacy journalism, which is really training them to be propagandists, in how to do this process while avoiding the risks of lawsuits. They're actively trained to do this at CNN, Washington Post, New York Times, et cetera, et cetera. This business model extends all the way down to social media trolls who build audiences, clicks, and followers by publishing salacious and unfounded rumors, speculation, and accusations. Followers, clicks, likes, and trollery can be directly converted into revenue. But they are doing so by extracting value without your permission. Your reputational value is being pulled out weaponized, reformulated, and used for purposes of advancing economic interests of third parties without your permission, okay? Again, this, I believe, fits Rothbart's second criteria, the criteria of generating wealth through theft. I think they're thieving, they're stealing parts of the essence of you there's a quote from 1962, a character that you, any of you that have read uh, Brave New World know Aldous Huxley. 1962, there's a fantastic interview in 1962, black and white, where he talks about this kind of stuff. He talks about propaganda, censorship, and uh, the ability to uh, manipulate populations. He asserts, by means of ever more effective methods of mind manipulation, the democracies will change their nature. The quaint old forms, elections, parliaments, supreme courts, and all the rest will remain. This is 1962. The underlying substance will be a new kind of totalitarianism. All the traditional names, all the hallowed slogans will remain exactly like they were in the good old days. Democracy and freedom will be the theme of every broadcast and editorial. Meanwhile, the ruling oligarchy with its highly trained elite will quietly run the show as they see fit. Now, I don't want to get too partisan here, but does this sound familiar? Psychological warfare is when psychological operations methods are used by governments against a foreign population classically, or even against the citizens of a government in a coordinated fashion, okay? Psychological warfare is the new battlefront. NATO calls it hybrid warfare. It, it, the goal here and the reality, the realization, is that governments can be more effectively managed and overthrown instead of relying on kinetic warfare through the use of propaganda, media, and psychological uh, manipulation techniques. And once that was appreciated, then the, particularly the Western Alliance, the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance, which many assert is the most powerful intelligence organization in modern history, 
For those who are not familiar with Five Eyes, this is the intelligence alliance that exists between the United States, the UK government, the Canadian government, the government of New Zealand, and the government of Australia. Now, for those of you that were kind of alert and awake and watching what happened during the COVID crisis, you know, we could say Austria, perhaps, but those have been the harshest, most totalitarian nation states in terms of their responses. They have all acted in harmony. They have acted based on coordinated information and strategies, the Five Eyes Alliance. And they, together with NATO, have built a suite of technologies that are extremely powerful for manipulating information not just manipulating information. The tech is so powerful now that everything that you think, feel, believe, the information that you encounter that's available to you can be managed and manipulated. And you think that you're immune to it because you're so highly educated and, and intelligent. Okay, it turns out that the more highly educated people are the most susceptible to these technologies. Folks like me that have been through a stupid amount of postgraduate training are all basically trained to accept authority, to accept and assimilate the, the information that is put to us. People ask me all the time, what happened to the medical profession? The medical profession is all trained to basically regurgitate whatever they're told and to follow along with the guidance that are provided by people that are further up in the food chain. Okay, the ones, by the way, that have been most resistant in general to the propaganda and manipulation during the COVID crisis are often the ones that are out on the street, the common workers, the carpenters, uh, the HVAC folks, the people that just work for a living that aren't caught up in this world of the mind that you all are, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So don't tell yourself that it's not gonna happen to you. Probability is that you are extremely susceptible to this type of manipulation. Now, some of you may remember my speaking about mass formation psychosis on Rogan. Literally broke the internet. Google had to manually manipulate search results because they didn't like people finding out about those concepts because they were fundamentally threatening to Google's business model, okay? But mass formation psychosis is in mass formation, the process of the formation of crowds, the basis for totalitarianism is only one aspect of this. That's, that has to do with the fundamental problems associated with social disassociation, with all of you folks sitting here on your cell phones, not being well connected to other members of your community, bless your hearts for what's happening here, I love it, where you're all talking to each other, that's how we avoid those kinds of things, but you are all being subjected on a daily basis, you're being bombarded by propaganda by psychological warfare, by psychological manipulation. Psychological bioterrorism is the use of fear about a disease to manipulate individuals or populations by governments and other organizations such as Big Pharma. Although the fear of infectious disease is an, often, is an obvious example, it's not the only way that psychological bioterrorism is used. Other examples include propaganda regarding environmental toxins, unsafe drinking water, soil contamination, climate change risk. Another name for psychological bioterrorism is information bioterrorism. And by the way, that process is well-defined. There are well-defined steps. If I get time, I'll go through them. That have been developed and deployed by intelligence communities on all sides, okay? What you have just been subjected to over the last four years, it absolutely aligns with well-known processes for manipulating your existential fear of death. It is the most powerful emotion you have, your fear of death. Remember, who read Dune? Fear is the mind killer, right? 
fear is extremely powerful. Existential fear can be easily manipulated to get you to do almost anything. And the intelligence community knows this. They built these capabilities over decades, and they've refined it to a fine art. As I said, there's a series of well-defined steps that are used in deploying this, and I'm just gonna tell you a little anecdote. The other day I was on uh, um, X, Spaces, Twitter Spaces, um, with a bunch of folks that have come through the COVID crisis, come through the events asso associated with the international health regulations and the WHO and all that kind of stuff, and they wanted to talk about bird flu. And what blew my mind is they were completely unaware that they had assimilated all the fear narrative that is being so actively promoted in the media right now about bird flu. And they were regurgitating it to me. Oh my God, this is gonna happen again. They're gonna use this to manipulate the elections. We're gonna have lockdowns. We're gonna have masking. They're gonna deploy these vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. All this fear narrative, all based around the thesis, and people were regurgitating it to me, that this is a highly lethal pathogen. And yet, there is no evidence of sustained human-to-human -human, uh, transmission. There are no cases of hospitalization or death being reported in the United States from bird flu. This is all a manufactured crisis. And it's following exactly, think about it, just step back for a minute. It is following book, chapter, and verse, what got deployed during the COVID crisis. Okay? And yet still, these people that should have been the most sensitized to it, the most aware, were falling right in it. That's how powerful this tech is. You think you can resist it, you can't. My only hope is by getting folks to understand these things, that's why I lecture on it, that you, you can build some resistance in yourself, intellectually, knowing that these things are out there, that they are being deployed on you, you can cognitively process and be aware that you are being manipulated and hopefully, just like your awareness of how they sell you soap, okay, propaganda and marketing are kissing cousins. And as Americans, largely, that have grown up under modern marketing techniques, you're fairly resistant to all the methods they have to sell you soap and hamburgers and everything else. It still works, obviously. We've got a population that's getting fat and eating McDonald's all the time. But uh, compared to what happens in the emerging markets, um, Latin America and Africa, those people are sitting ducks for modern marketing technology. The same holds for psychological warfare, propaganda. Now, I've introduced psychological bioterrorism, psi war. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what is fifth generation warfare. Fifth generation warfare has become a mainstay, as I mentioned, of NATO strategy, Russian strategy, battlefield strategy across the world. What does this mean, this term? Fifth generation warfare sounds very scary. And it makes it sound as if warfare has discrete stages, okay? First generation warfare, sticks and stones, we're throwing them at each other. Second generation warfare, um, we have uh, more of a kinetic component, but it's still typically under centralized control. Third generation warfare. Third generation warfare is uh, you have um, increasing decentralization of command chain. Think about uh, the Blitzkrieg. Um, the Germans during World War II were masters of third generation warfare. They gave battlefield commanders freedom to operate um, and uh, they deployed non-traditional means and strategies um, to overcome their opponent. Fourth gen warfare, in a, in a nutshell, is uh, what we have seen deployed by Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and the Viet Cong, okay? It's, it's these resistance movements that have a uh, typically a religious component um, in addition to a kinetic component. 
kinetic warfare component, guns and tanks and whatnot. Um, fourth generation warfare, I assert, and many others, the United States military has not won a single fourth generation war. Okay? And, and with the emergence of fourth generation war, the US military has become aware, NATO's become aware, Five Eyes Alliance has become aware of the crucial importance that um, is, is mentioned in extensively in the art of war. I mean, this has been around for millennia, these ideas, that the ability to manipulate uh, one's opponent and the population within one's opponent uh, is, is the best way to win at warfare, to overcome your opponent. And these guerrilla movements have used it extremely effectively. They don't have to have centralized control. Remember, that's another key thing. Osama got killed, what happened? Boom, total decentralization, it became even harder. All they did was propagate the logic that, well, you gotta go out and kill Americans. We really don't care how you do it, and we don't care who's leading your particular cell. That becomes extremely effective. You're faced with whack-a-mole if you're an organized military. What are you gonna do? Oh, you're gonna try to get more expert at using propaganda and information warfare in order to counter the messaging that's coming from your opponent. That's fifth gen. Okay, that is Psy War. That is a technology suite that was built for offshore combat by our military and the UK in particular, working closely with their intelligence communities, uh, to give us new capabilities to counter these insurgency movements. And what's happened is, uh, as often happens with governments and technology in general, once the tech exists, it gets deployed for other purposes, purposes that happen to be politically convenient at that time. And I've spoken to many people that have been part of these CYWAR units uh, in Europe and in the United States. And a lot of these retired colonels are pretty pissed off because the tech and capabilities that they helped develop for offshore combat, they know are now being deployed against civilian populations. Not just civilian populations, they're being deployed against the populations of their own citizenry. Yes, sir. What are the, uh, give some examples of what technology is used? Yeah, there's a, a, so in the book we go into it at length. Uh, listing them out, you know, we'll kill the rest of the half an hour that I've got left. Um, uh, the uh, uh, weaponization of propaganda, the use of, uh, for instance, uh, just to give you one specific example, there's a military battle unit in the UK called the 77th Brigade. And the 77th Brigade also has an informal component that's referred to in, the, in social media as the Mutton Crew, okay? And there's something analogous that the CDC is fund, funded um, uh, through uh, the public good projects and the Shots Heard Around the World program. Basically, these groups engage in cyber stalking uh, against individuals is one example. So if you're identified, so I'll, I'll give you a very discreet example. Um, you ever, are you a software person at all? Okay, there's a, a, a program that's used in software development and uh, deployment, uh, that generates a tracking feature called a Jura ticket. Um, it's one of their outputs. It's when you call in and you complain about some software bug that you've encountered, and they say, oh, we've created a ticket for that. Okay, and we'll get back to you after we solve this ticket. And they become very obsessed about fixing it. That's a Jura ticket, okay? It was recently revealed in congressional uh, testimony and reports that I have Jura tickets that have been developed by the US government that identify me as having certain characteristics. I'm an anti-vaxxer and I'm a conservative. Those were sufficient to merit the deployment 
of uh, weaponized propaganda against me in social media, targeting through these various uh, groups like the, the groups, the crowd stalking activities, in which uh, the CDC and in the UK, uh, the 77th Brigade, for instance, targeted Andrew Bridgen. Uh, they target me every time I go over there. Um, and you'll see just a slew of concerted trollery attacks and other misinformation and disinformation being promoted against those who have said things which are contrary to the accepted narrative. Just one example, okay? It's, it's full front media warfare, coordinated and facilitated, in this case, by the federal government. Um, there's there's a, another example that's in the book uh, that's come out from congressional testimony about uh, weaponization of other strategies that the government deploys in psychological warfare against me personally, but it's been deployed against anybody, journalists, anybody that uh, speaks out in, in, in ways that are, are contrary to the government's approved narrative that these products are safe and effective. Okay? Safe and effective itself is a psychological warfare tool. This is called neuro-linguistic programming. You're seeing it all the time right now in the election. I mean, the election is an amazing little microcosm of, of this tech. Um, neuro-linguistic programming has to do with messaging, subtle messaging to you that causes you to make assum assumptions and to embed uh, thoughts. You can think of it as subliminal programming, okay? Safe and effective, safe and effective, safe and effective. How many times have you heard that? Okay, they never qualify what constitutes safe, nor what, quanti quant what constitutes effective. They use those terms, they embed into your lizard brain. And you can't resist them. You, you assume that they are safe and effective. This, these have emotional content that comes straight into you. So you ask for some examples, there's a couple there's a wealth of these technologies, um, and they go way down into the weeds in terms of uh, ability to manipulate all kinds of information. This, this is now um, core capabilities of uh, the extended uh, CYWAR units in the United States military, which are extensive. Um, and by the way, that is authorized to be deployed against American civilians by the U.S. Army in the event of a crisis. Another thing we've documented, we've gone right straight down to the manuals. There's all this talk about how the CIA can't deploy psychological warfare and information warfare against American citizens. That's wrong, okay? That's untrue. Operation Mockingbirds is still ongoing, if you're familiar with what I'm talking about. The manipulation of the press by the intelligence community, and by this now what we mean is the extended uh, intelligence community that largely is centered around Department of Homeland Security. Okay, that, that is now routinely deployed. Now, I'm, I'm never gonna get through this talk. Um, another definition, mis, dis, and malinformation. I am guilty I mean, I had, I had an a, uh, expert witness report um, in, in San Diego thrown out by a judge because I am judged guilty of spreading misinformation on the basis of an article published in the New York Times and the Washington Post. That's called hearsay evidence. But they both asserted that I'm a spreader of misinformation. Why did they say that? Well, it turns out the government asserted that I was spreading misinformation for, among other things, saying that these vaccines were not safe and effective. And the reasons why, and you've seen those podcasts, et cetera, okay? But that was sufficient to cause me to be labeled. Why were those of us that were saying these things that were just based on scientific data, medical truths, labeled in this way? Because of the logic that the virus was so pathogenic, which turns out it's not, um, and the vaccines are so safe and effective that anyone that would cause people to become vaccine hesitant would be guilty of 
causing unnecessary death. I mean, I've, there's five or six different ways I've been accused of being a mass murderer, and that's one of them. Um, uh, and in the face of the risk of someone sharing information, which may be true, which would cause someone to become vaccine hesitant, that was sufficient to justify virtually anything short of, of assassination um, to cause that person to no longer be able to share that information. That's, that's the underpinning logic that we saw in the COVID crisis, and that's now been broadened to questioning climate change, uh, questioning uh, whether or not, Cam not to get too political, whether or not Kamala Harris was uh, a border czar. I mean, it, we've now kind of normalized this process uh, to control information that's inconsistent with what the state wants to be the approved narrative. And they have a language around it. It's mis, dis, and malinformation. I'm accused of spreading misinformation. So what is misinformation, this great sin that I and others are accused of? Misinformation is information which you share which differs from the approved narrative as promoted by, in this case, because we're talking about public health, NIH, CDC, or the World Health Organization. If I say something that's different from what the approved narrative is coming from WHO, CDC, or NIH, which have been repeatedly proven to be false, I am guilty of spreading misinformation. Now, what's disinformation, if that's misinformation? Disinformation is if I'm doing it for political purposes. Let's imagine, and I, I'm not, uh, I have not endorsed Bobby Kennedy, but let's imagine that I've endorsed Bobby Kennedy and I'm spreading his, his messaging regarding vaccines and vaccine safety because I want to help get him elected. Okay, that would be disinformation because it would be different from the approved narrative, but it would be being spread for political purposes. Now here's the kicker. What is malinformation? as defined by the Department of Homeland Security, Secretary Mayorkas. And by the way, all three of these are defined in a DHS memorandum as being domestic terrorism. When you say that Robert Malone or you, or you, are spreading misinformation, that is now equated to saying that you are a domestic terrorist. Um, malinformation is information which may be true but causes the receiver, the recipient of that malinformation to become more distrustful of the government. Okay, I guarantee that you all have heard a bucket load of malinformation over the last couple of days. <laughs> okay, you've been subjected to, by Secretary Mayorkas' definition, a fire hose of, of, um, of terrorism of domestic terrorism, okay? That's how insidious this is. Now I'm gonna introduce another thing. The concept of the banality of evil. As I've tried to think about all this and talking to other people, people again and again and again talk about what has been happening has been evil. It, it for some of us, we don't have language I could never imagine that I would be talking about things like good and evil <coughs> as a scientist. It's just kind of foreign. It's not part of my language. And yet over the four, last four years, it's become commonplace. I, I don't have any other language than the, the language of faith to express a lot of the phenomena that I'm observing. And evil is one of them. And I, and I started using this term evil to describe what I was seeing in these processes that are occurring by our government, by corporations, by mass media, etc. I I truly believe that the deployment of psychological warfare against civilian populations is fundamentally evil. That, for me, is really problematic when I start ascribing evil intent to third persons because I don't really know what's in their heart. I don't really know what they're thinking. And in trying to process my own model for what's transpired, um, I found that the, the book, 
the concepts of Hannah Arndt in her 1963 book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil, to be really helpful. Okay? The concept of the banality of evil is often misunderstood as suggesting that evil is ordinary or common. Not true. Hannah Arndt's intention was to highlight the fact that evil is not necessarily driven by a desire for destruction or chaos, but rather by a lack of thought and consideration for the consequences of one's actions. The banality of evil often arises from bureaucracies. They have their own intrinsic logic and structure. People that exist within those bureaucracies, and including Eichmann, one of the key organizers of the Holocaust, essentially takes the position, as do the people that were driving the trains and so many other activities that contributed to the Holocaust during World War II, they were just doing their job. They were just following orders. They were just fitting in. The banality of evil refers to the fact that evil be can be committed by ordinary, unremarkable people, including bureaucrats, who are not driven by a desire for evil. They're not Mr. Evil scheming, but rather by a lack of moral imagination, a failure to think critically about the consequences of their, interaction, of their actions. Banality of evil arises from individuals that are just going along to get along. They're not thinking about the consequences of what they're doing. They're not thinking about the bigger picture. A lot of this stuff all originates in a, a failure of people to think and take ownership and responsibility for their actions, which, of course, trying to bring it back, is at the core of libertarian thought, that you take responsibility for your actions. And based on this, I came up with a model. It's a Venn diagram. Sorry, I don't have it as a slide. What has really occurred over the last four years? What is occurring now? I think we have the interaction of three major forces. One is just gross incompetence. One is nefarious scheming. There absolutely have people, been people that have taken advantage of uh, the COVID crisis for economic and other benefits, political benefits. Nefarious scheming can't be denied. The other is the, the complexity of the systems that we've developed, complex systems. And at this intersection, of incompetence, nefarious scheming, and complex systems, we have a number of other phenomena that emerge. <clears throat> At the interface between incompetence and complex systems, we have arbitrary bureaucracy. At the interface of incompetence and nefarious scheming, we have unanticipated consequences. At the interface of nefarious scheming and complex systems, we have corruption. And right in the center of all, all of these forces, we have the banality of evil. That is my model for what's gone on. It's not just Klaus Schwab is the evil puppet master, that kind of narrative that we've heard promoted again and again. A lot of this has to do with the complex systems in which we are living right now. And this is a diversion, but I want to touch on it. Um, and we saw it emerge really graphically with the CrowdStrike event. One of the problems, we, we in an earlier lecture, we heard somebody just touching gently, not even using the terms, on DEI, on the substitution of the social agendas for a commitment that was normative previously for um, excellence, uh, that we have culturally increasingly come to value these social agenda issues like diversity, equity, inclusion, instead of other core issues that in my age were the center of uh, everything, if, you know, in seeking an education, building a career, seeking advancement, et cetera, which was merit, education, and intelligence. The problem with substituting DEI kind of concepts, which is a core of the New World Order, of this uh, Great Reset, of uh, stakeholder capitalism, OK? 
okay, that corporations should not be so focused on profit, they should be focused on the social good that they generate, okay? It's, 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 it's fundamentally repugnant to the logic of Rothbard and Mises and, and the whole libertarian concept, as far as I'm concerned. But the underlying that is that if we choose to build our society and our systems around these social agendas, like diversity, equity, and inclusion, what we will do is gradually degrade the capability of the complex systems which we rely on to function. And this kind of cascading failure that we've seen with the COVID crisis in so many ways, the corruption, the misrepresentation, the uh, failure to think, the you know, rampant failure of the medical system, it's just undeniable. That kind of complex system failure um, will become more and more and more common because we've built a, a edifice in the Western world of interacting highly complex systems that require deep technical expertise in order to maintain. We're talking about air traffic control, computer computational systems like CrowdStrike. Um, and, and you know, that was a, that was, for those of you that aren't coders and wonks, that was a simple coding error in a pointer in C++. It took out the biggest system-wide computer failure in the history of the world because somebody didn't do their job right in coding and somebody else didn't do their job right in terms of quality control. And the whole system all over the world failed. Okay, we're gonna see more and more and more of that if we fail to focus on merit, education, and intelligence, and instead substitute these various social agendas in, in maintaining our infrastructure, our human capital. Enough on that. Regarding COVID crisis, medical freedom, and freedom in general, the government's willing to willingness to deploy modern cognitive and psychological warfare tools, by the way, those are two different things. Cognitive warfare tools go into your subconsciousness. Psychological warfare tools approach your conscious mind. Governments willing to deploy modern cognitive and psychological warfare tools and technologies against their own citizenry in combination with collusion and co coercion using the power of modern big information technologies and evil the world has never known before. We give rights to our government. You guys, this, this is for you. We give rights to our government in exchange for our government's commitment to providing security, furthering prosperity, and respecting people's autonomy, sovereignty, and will. Over the last four years, many have come to learn that there's a suite of technologies and capabilities that have been developed over decades, which can influence everything that we think, feel, hear, and believe. That's what I'm talking about. Your mind is not your own. These technologies have been developed and deployed for offshore use, as I mentioned, <coughs> specifically to advance American interests through the US State Department, the intelligence community, CIA, and Department of Defense. I mentioned about five eyes. This has also been bundled with the initiative that the United States has felt consequent to World War II and the collapse of the um, imperialist government organizations throughout Europe, that we're the good guys. The United States the good guys. We have this constitution, we believe in the rule of law, um, we have a moral fabric, and if we didn't step into the power vacuum left after World War II, then the USSR would, China would, etc. We must act as an imperialist power to fill that power void and use every skill and capability that we can to do so. That has led us into the modern position. Do you know that there's been over 70 regime changes managed by the CIA since the end of World War II? We believe that this is okay. Not only that, we believe that assassination is okay as a way to 
manage uh, these political structures. And I assert that what we've done is we've normalized these methods, including assassination, to the point where we had an American president that was perceived as a risk to American foreign policy, and he was assassinated. There was a coup against JFK. We've been living with that ever since. And the technology has just gotten more and more and more powerful. Now, I'm running out of time. I'm going to just kind of help you, try to help you to comprehend the world that you are living in now and you're going to live in the rest of your lives. Twitter was developed as a weapon. Facebook was developed as a weapon. They were developed as weapons by the CIA. <coughs> Google was, is powered by the CIA. Google was created at Stanford using CIA funding. CIA transferred the technology for Google Maps. That's where it comes from. Okay, so what, what am I talking about? Here's an example. The example that uh, demonstrates how powerful this tech is, is what transpired with Arab Spring. Arab Spring was the first clear, unequivocal, fifth generation warfare battle that, that was won. Repeated regime change, starting with Tunisia. The thing is that with these social media platforms, the tech exists. I know this because I used to support a client that built some of this tech called Behavioral Matrix. With the words that you post on social media or any media platform, they can extract your emotional state. It's all validated using statistics. The words that you use can be used to basically peer into your mind, to extract your emotional state, and then map it in a cloud of influence with the other people that you're interacting with on social media. And that cloud, statistically validated cloud of, of, of interactions um, can be used to pull out those within that sphere that are expressing emotions and thoughts that those that are managing it wish to elevate or suppress. You ever heard of shadow banning? Shadow banning is just part of the toolkit. Okay? Those influencers can be um, manipulated so that they are more widely circulated and influencing that cloud, or less so. It can be manipulated so that you can pick out voices that are saying, we need to go attack the palace, or we need to all meet here, or whatever the thing is, and then propagated through that entire matrix. You asked for examples, okay? This is how this tech was built as a weapon. Um, it can move populations and did so um, clearly documented during Arab Spring to result in multiple examples of regime change. Extremely powerful. Grease lightning. What's not to like if you're the CIA? Um, and, and we didn't have to go shoot missiles. We didn't have to shoot guns. But this tech... Remember, if you're interacting on your little social media platform, which you call your cell phone, and there's two, or even better, three cell towers within range, you can be precisely triangulated in three-dimensional space. You can be kinetically targeted with extreme precision, and that database all gets linked to Gorgon Stair. These are the high-resolution satellite imagery technology that exists. So, who you are, what you look like, what your vehicle is, who you're associated with, what you're saying on social media, all that stuff is captured and tracked and weaponized. All great, you know, if this is your business. And then along comes UKIP, Nigel Farage, and Brexit.
okay? And oops, it got turned on its head. Cambridge Analytica and the Trump election, oops, got turned on its head. And suddenly, the intelligence community realized they had a problem. And that was embodied in, for instance, in one example, in the Obama lectures that were given at the Hoover Institute in which he justified the need for censorship and propaganda, okay? They believe they, that because of these capabilities and the risks, because underneath the risk of Brexit, the realization of Brexit was Frexit and Grexit and the destruction of the European Union that we've so carefully created. And if the EU falls, NATO falls, and American foreign policy is a destroyed. And that's why they feel that it's absolutely necessary and justified to do this. Um, but the problem is, as I said, is the slippery slope. Once they're doing it for that reason, then they're doing it for this reason, then they're doing it because of vaccine hesitancy and anti-vaxxers, then they're doing it for climate change deniers, then they're doing it for people that are in the opposite political party. Dr. Malone, a conservative, okay? Now, I've run out of time. Um, uh, so much more I can cover. Uh, the book is, I think, 130,000 words. Uh, extensive documentation of the, the technology and the means and the logic and what this is being used to drive the interface with the World Health Organization, with the United Nations. If you haven't heard what Agenda 2030 is, you better figure it out. It's considered an international treaty, by the way. Among other things in Agenda 2030 is the assertion is that, it, that it's a fundamental human right to migrate and live wherever in the world you want, okay? A lot of these things that you encounter, open borders, it just doesn't make sense, right? No, it's codified specifically in Agenda 2030. This is the new world order that you have to deal with. I'm gonna be dead, <laughs> okay? All I can do is what I'm trying to do right now is to help teach, reach you, you know, and this is a powerful group. What Mises has assembled here, I'm really impressed with. I'm impressed with seeing all of you having these deep intellectual conversations over burrs um, uh, about all kinds of things. It's just fantastic. Um, and I can tell you that this kind of thing is starting to happen all across the Western world. It's happening that the people that are driving the populist movement in Europe are the people that are your age. The people that are voting for the Lions for Deutschland, a, a party that has been made illegal in the state of Germany. Here's a fun fact. If you fly the German flag in Germany, you're considered a neo-Nazi. If you support nationalism, you're considered a neo-Nazi. That's where this has gone in Europe. And it's folks your age that are starting to stand up and say no. This is not the world we want to live in. We don't want to live in a world dominated by surveillance capitalism and that logic. And I hope that this little time that I've spent with you, um, I've, I've helped to at least pique your curiosity. What the heck is this guy talking about? He sounds like a crazy, wild-eyed conspiracy theorist, okay? And it, it does sound that way, but it's all real. It's all documented. This is what's going on underneath. This is the world that you're inheriting. And my challenge and question to you is what are you gonna do about it? Thanks a lot for listening. I'm glad to take questions. Please, oh, let's go. Uh, my question is related to uh, social media. So like Alphabet and Meta and Amazon exist for profit. What would you say to someone who doesn't mind giving up um, 
their uh, knowledge of their consumer and religious um, preferences in return for having free use of those services. They want to do it voluntarily. I think that's their right. Okay? And I, and I really am convinced, compelled, and committed to this underpinning logic that we're, for want of another word, we're calling libertarianism or we're calling anarcho-capitalism. I, I think this is the most powerful, intriguing domain intellectually in the world right now. And, and just like I'm committed to free speech, even when it's free speech that hurts me um, from the trolls and the haters and everything else, um, I can't say, no, you can't say those things uh, and still be committed to free speech. And I can't be committed to free markets and say, no, we have to constrain these people. They shouldn't be allowed to give up their information. But I think... The, the getting back, and this is what's troubling me, and, and I would really love to learn from work product of the Mises Institute about how I can better think about this. But I assert that this is an unwilling extraction, and it's not my conceptualization. We are being treated as a natural resource that's being mined to extract information, the best metaphor is the matrix, okay? To extract value from us without our permission, then reformulate that and repeatedly resell it, okay? And that's theft. The, that's why I use these terms like soul, okay? Now, if, if Meta and, you know, Amazon, bless their hearts, it's the same business model, they're just more vertically integrated than the other two, right? Facebook and Meta resell the information to third-party marketers, but Amazon has just built the whole stack, right? So, but it's the same business model. But they, they're doing it surreptitiously and they are working extremely hard to avoid any kind of constraints. They don't recognize, think about it, fundamentally, they refuse to recognize morality as a constraint on their business model. They, they have no respect for these essential characteristics that make you as a human you. They just feel that it's acceptable to reach right in without your permission, grab them out, reformulate them, and sell them off. That's theft. I think, as I'm trying to fit that business model into the logic of uh, Rothbard. That's why I started with that. And if somebody, if, if, if Facebook or, or whomever is open and transparent that this is what they're doing, and you are, rather than these sneaky little, you know, the, they pop up all the time, um, terms and conditions all written in tiny little language, intentionally Byzantine. Okay, see, nobody reads them. Nobody really processes what it is they're saying they're going to take from you. Okay, that's, that's not, I, I don't think that's acceptable. Um, and it, that's why I started by saying I find this really troubling because here we, we're all committed, I think, to um, free markets. And here we have a market concept that's commodified in, by the way, it's part of a broader trend. They want, there's, you know, this, this is an unregulated space economically that they've figured out a business model to come in and commodify and capitalize and extract value out of. But there, the difference is that, you know, in, Mies, in, in Rothbart's analysis, uh, wealth is generated by humans extracting and building value um, from the surrounding world, the earth. Here, it's extracting value from you, from humans. And personally, I think that's fundamentally different. And I think that to do that without being open and transparent is, is a fundamental violation 
of ethics, and I don't know how to fit that into the, the intellectual space of libertarianism. Does that help? Have I answered your question? Yeah. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Stump. My question is, how do we practically fight against psychological warfare? Right. So um, uh, I put a bunch of chapters in the end, Jill and I have, um, and we put in chapters that our prior book is not to pump, but, you know, hey, it's economics. Um, uh, uh, Lies My Government Told Me and the Better Future Coming. I always try to include suggestions for what we can do. I think we're facing an environment in which uh, you individually have to make some choices about the extent to which you allow yourself to be integrated into this new system, this new world, this information matrix. Um, one of the fundamental truths of psychological warfare is the only way, you know, this is a real surreal landscape. It, it, people refer to it as the post-truth environment. Truth is entirely subjective now. Um, and the only way to win at psychological warfare is not to play. Um, uh, I think personally that um, as this tech and as the culture is passing through this period where this has become normalized, the only a form of resistance and um, protection is a, a commitment to a decentralized lifestyle to kind of moving off of, of a lot of these systems. Um, and, and I personally think that's, hence, it comes back to Galt's Gulch, um, if you're an Ayn an Rand fan. Um, I kind of think we're going to have to build uh, systems and capabilities that exist in parallel outside of that. Um, and that means we have to go back and rethink all of these assumptions like the nature of money and the barter system and whether or not we really want to invest in Bitcoin or we're going to have to go back to um, that's why I, you know, I so much enjoyed the book on what has the government done with our money. Um, you know, what bar, there, the, these fundamental characteristics that Rothbard teaches that money has to have, divisibility, ready exchange and portability, um, things that can't be solved with the barter system. I, again and again, I hear people saying, oh, we just got to go back to barter. No, I'm sorry. Read the damn book, right? Um, uh, so I, I really think that the way, the, our only option to protect ourselves is to force ourselves into a new way of being. Um, and I think that if you think of it, you know, you can think of it as, oh no, as if I didn't have enough complexity in my life. Or you can say, oh, we finally have a real strong justification for building our own new world order instead of reacting to the globalist version that Klaus Schwab wants to promote to us that is going to lead us into this transhuman reality where uh, humanity becomes an obsolete uh, entity, a uh, pet of, uh, of human-machine fusions. That's where they're going. Um, I don't want to live there. And I bet you don't either. And so somehow we're going to have to force ourselves to think this through and come up with new systems. That's the best I can do, basically. <laughs>